If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Taking all for all, God's worst is better than the devil's best. And the portion of God's saints at the lowest ebb is better than the portion of the wicked, even when their joys are at the flood. I am going to speak at this time upon our text as a statement by itself. It is complete and self-contained. It is a diamond of the first water. Its words are few, but its sense is precious. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. Well, Bob, I, I feel like uh, we're in a library of sorts here. Well, it looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, this is... books for Spurgeon. There was enough of them to make a little library. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a prince of preachers. And in fact, uh, the viewers of uh, uh, this telecast, Pilgrim Publications, got a little taste of him here at the beginning of the show. The uh, image that they saw on their screen was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and uh, that was a clip from one of his, his sermons. Right. Well, uh, a lot of people may not recognize Spurgeon. We sometimes assume everyone knows who he is. He lived in the 1800s in England. He was the greatest Baptist preacher of that time and probably of any time so far as we uh, have regard for him. And these are some of the books that we've published by him. And that's what we're going to talk about today is uh, the writings of Spurgeon. Well, Bob, since you are director of Pilgrim Publications, Pilgrim Publications is probably, in my estimation, and maybe the estimation of a lot of people, one of the world's leading publishers of the works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon anywhere. And so uh, you... Uh, would probably be one of the people that would be more knowledgeable of Spurgeon's writings and works than uh, most, most people. Well, Larry, I have been uh, having Spurgeon rub off on me a long time. I first started when I was about 18 years old, uh, reading, collecting uh, things by Spurgeon, and then on down through the years, we got into publishing. But uh, no person, uh, other than my parents perhaps, and sometimes I wonder about them, I've had more influence on my own life and the route that it's taken than Spurgeon. And uh, exposure to his writings, his sermons, his books has certainly been uh, a foundation in uh, what life I have lived. And it, it's strange that a person dead for about 100 years when I first became acquainted with him uh, could have that kind of influence on you. But uh, it has been that way, and it's been a joy. It's been a blessing. Now, what, when did you say Charles Haddon Spurgeon lived? And he's from England. Well, he uh, was born in 1834, and he died in 1892. Uh, right now, that's over 100 years ago. I kind of exaggerated a while ago. I actually became acquainted with Spurgeon in about 1953. So at that point in time, it was not 100 years, but now <laughs> it is. But he lived in England, and uh, he's buried there in London. And recently, I had the blessing and privilege to visit his tomb. 
and to see the place where Spurgeon was buried and to visit his uh, church and his college and various and sundry places that relate to his life. But that's the period in which he lived, one of the, um, well, significant periods of English history because the British Empire was kind of drawing to its close in the sense of being the worldwide empire that it had been. And uh, then when we get into this century, the history of the British Empire, of course, has gone the route that, that we know. Uh, and it's not the formidable worldwide empire that it once was. But Spurgeon lived during the reign of Queen Victoria. And uh, that says a lot within itself with regard to the type of England that it lived in, what's called Victorian England. Mm -hmm. And uh, now talking about the works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, of which you, throughout your life, I guess since 1950, the 1950s and onward, uh, particularly with the, your organization, Pilgrim Publications, you personally have been involved in reprinting a lot of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's works. Right. My original goal, Larry, was to reprint the sermon series, the uh, large set of books consisting of about six to 700 pages per volume called the New Park Street and Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit. These books here, these first three we have on this shelf, are the six volumes, actually, in the New Park Street pulpit. This particular volume here is the last volume in the series, and it incorporates the sermons for the 62nd and the 63rd volume. And then these three books here illustrate just a selection out of the series of the Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit. Now, this took us about 12 years or more to complete uh, the reprinting of this, 63 volumes, large hardback books, as I said, some of them over 700 pages in length. And uh, uh, during that period of time, we had to even reprint some of those with, that we had previously printed because the demand for them was such that uh, they just kept going on. And as time went on, some of them went out of print. We had to reprint those and it's seldom now that we ever have them all back in print at any given time because there's so many of them and we're so limited in our financial ability uh, to keep all these things afloat but the Lord willing we will continuously keep printing them at least as long as I have anything to do with it and the Lord furnishes the means to do so we will have Spurgeon sermons being churned out the New Park Street Pulpit, the first six volumes, and then beginning in volume seven, uh, which is this volume right here, incidentally, for the year 1861. Now, each volume represents a year of preaching. Uh, Spurgeon just doesn't sit down and write all these out at one particular period of time. These are sermons that he preached morning and night over a period of many years. And even after he died, the sermon set had not all been printed because some of the sermons that, that had been taken down by stenographers had still been unpublished. So after he died for 25 years, believe it or not, weekly the individual sermon came out and then yearly the volume came out and that went on up into 1917 when it closed. Spurgeon having died in 1892. Sometimes I get the question, how could you publish sermons of a man who died uh, in 1892 and you're still coming out with sermons after that? It's because so many of his sermons had not been published. These are not repetitions. There's no duplicates in this set of books. And from 1855 uh, uh, to 19, 1892, we have the life of Spurgeon at that period of time. These books were coming out. Then in 1892 to 1917, the sermons after his death were published. Now, uh, just for the uninitiated people out there watching us right now, probably most of them, uh, a lot of them anyway, have probably have never heard of Spurgeon, don't know who he is. Was he just uh, some quaint little English Baptist preacher over in London in the 1800s that had a, a few hundred followers and not much other influence. Or tell us a little bit more about his 
background and what kind of influence he had on the, his society. Well, as a young man, Spurgeon was uh, called to a pastor in London, in the south of London, called New Park Street Chapel. And uh, at that time, it wasn't a very large church, although it was one of the most prestigious and historically significant churches of the Baptists in London uh, during that, that time and the years before. Uh, John Gill, for example, had been the pastor, and he's a well-known name in Baptist history. And uh, Benjamin Keach and John Rippon, people of that kind were of this group of Baptists. And uh, when Spurgeon came there as a young man in 1854, at the, I think it was at the age of 19, almost 20, uh, he immediately became a hit, so to speak, with his style, he was a country bumpkin in the eyes of many, but he was a smart man. He was uh, educated in a, in a sense, but uneducated in another sense. And, and I mean by that, Spurgeon had educated himself and had also been tutored by a private tutor at a school. And so he was very intelligent and, and well-trained, and yet he had not been to Oxford or Cambridge or one of those type schools that the ministers uh, in England you know, they coveted that kind of background. So in London, he became a hit, and his unorthodox style, it was an innovative style, and it was a uh, popular style. And so he just began to draw all kinds of people to hear him. And before long, the church couldn't hold him. They had to build a tabernacle. He called it a tabernacle, Metropolitan Tabernacle. And it would seat around 6,000 people. And then there was some room for standing room, I think, also. And uh, he was always, uh, the crowds were always filling the place up. And uh, his reputation began to expand as they uh, began to publish his sermons weekly. He got a worldwide reputation. Uh, so they started, he was not only packing his church with people that wanted to come, but you're saying the newspapers started to take his sermons and print them in the newspapers? Well, actually, the uh, man named Passmore was a member of Spurgeon's church. And it dawned on Passmore that here was a man whose sermons would be read by the public. And so he approached Spurgeon and proposed the idea that they start a weekly publication, which in those days some of the preachers were in the habit of doing, having their sermons printed each week. It was called Penny Pulpits. And in other words, I guess it would sell for a penny. It just to be a little, little individual pamphlet. And so uh, Spurgeon didn't think much of the idea at first, but he said, well, if you want to, you know, put this on your shoulders to uh, assume this responsibility, well, I'll go in a deal with you. So they struck a deal, and Larry, it was so profitable from the standpoint of the sales of sermon, Spurgeon never had to take a uh, salary from his church. He lived <laughs> off the royalties that was paid to him by his printer on the sale of the sermons. And so these were translated into other languages. They were spread around the world. Uh, one was found in the hat, by the way, of the famous missionary David Livingstone. When he died, uh, there was a sermon found in his hat, and the name of that sermon was Accidents, Not Punishments. David Livingstone, way out in Africa, was an admirer and reader of Spurgeon's sermons. And, uh, so you're saying he got a, almost a worldwide, I mean, so his influence wasn't restricted to just his little location, right. but even in the 1800s, right. it already spread way beyond the borders of England. And I don't think anyone would dispute the fact that uh, his sermons have been printed and distributed in a quantity that no one could touch uh, as a comparison or as a rival. Uh, his sermons have been printed in so many languages and his sermons have been kept in print through the years uh, in, in various forms, not necessarily the original form. Actually, we're the first to reprint the original format of Spurgeon's sermons. In other words, these are photographically reproduced. One thing a Spurgeon reader wants, and that is originality. He doesn't want an edited Spurgeon, an abridged Spurgeon. He doesn't want a sliced up, chopped together, uh, pasted together Spurgeon. He wants the original Spurgeon. And even if it's a misspelled word, he would rather read that and to think that someone had fooled with Spurgeon's writings to correct them. And so we reprinted the photographic process called offset printing. We reprinted from the original volumes, and they're just exactly as they were 
when they were first printed. And yet there have been many other forms of Spurgeon sermons that have been published down through the years that various and sundry publishers have uh, printed his sermons. And I, I don't think he has a rival in the Christian world, at least in the category of sermons, that anyone could compete with him in the uh, publication and distribution of what he preached. Now, now it sounds like he was so popular, uh, and you said his church was packing out. It almost sounds like he might have had to sell tickets for people to get in. Well, <laughs> they did have to distribute tickets. In other words, if you wanted a, a, a seat at the tabernacle, uh, you had to have a ticket. And uh, a ticket. Now, you're are you serious? Now, you're saying that people had to get a ticket to go to church. They didn't have to buy it, Larry. But there were only a certain number of seats. And in order for people not to overcrowd the place and not to be disappointed by coming in expecting to be able to get in being turned away, they had to uh, have tickets in advance. Now, Spurgeon, however, was conscious of the fact that, well, there are people who are not members of your church that they will want in. So occasionally Spurgeon would ask his congregation to go to church elsewhere or to stay home or whatever and let others come. And so on those days, the public had the opportunity to have a ticket to come to the tabernacle to hear him preach. Now, that's uh, quite an unusual thing, and I wouldn't say that very many preachers have adopted that method with regard to uh, getting their audience. But uh, such was the popularity of Spurgeon that that's what they had to do. That is incredibly, uh, I mean, to, to have tickets you know, you're, you're so popular, you have to give out tickets for well, people to come. Well, D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist, the American evangelist, whom we know quite well uh, from history, Moody went to London to hear Spurgeon one time when he was a young man before he even started preaching. He was just a Sunday school teacher, but he'd heard about Spurgeon. And I think it was like 1867. So Moody goes to London, and he said, I found out I couldn't get in without a ticket, but Moody says, somehow I managed to get in. Now, he doesn't say the, the slip in a side door or what, but somehow he said he managed to get in. Maybe some generous person offered Moody his seat. But uh, at any rate, uh, there were times that Spurgeon preached in other buildings, like he would preach in the Surrey Gardens Music Hall, which was a large, commodious place. He preached in Exeter Hall. Uh, I think there was another hall called the Royal Albert Hall. And he preached, preached in a place called the Royal Agricultural Hall. And he preached in this large building that was made out of glass called the Crystal Palace, which burned down in 1936, I believe it was. One of the immense buildings over there where they put on exhibitions and various and sundry uh, shows of all descriptions. And so he preached even out in the open air. And uh, wherever he preached, he filled the place up. And I suppose that he had a building that would seat 30, 40, 50 thousand like an Astrodome or a, uh, uh, some other stadium, the Rose Bowl or whatever it might be. He could have probably filled it up if you'd had an announcement in time for people to say, hey, I'm going to hear Spurgeon. So he was uh, just an amazing uh, preacher and uh, God chose him and used him and he's given us the benefit of the published sermons. Okay, so this establishes... What kind of impact he had on his culture, his popularity? Uh, just before we start an analysis of uh, Spur the Spurgeon Library, which is what we're going to be doing here, uh, just from your own knowledge and understanding of S Spurgeon's writings and his preaching, what, uh, what is the real power, or there may be some other descriptive term for it, that you see in his writings that that just seemed to captivate people more than, let's say, some other preacher. You know, for some reason, this man is has something with his preaching that other preachers don't have. Is there anything you've noticed in all your years of study that puts him in a class apart from maybe a lot of your other standard generic type preaching? Well, this is, uh, Larry, a very common question, and there have been different ones that have proposed answers to it, and I've tried to absorb some of the speculation and some of the thought that has been advanced along this line. And I believe that uh, maybe all of them have an element of truth about them. 
I think some people are drawn to Spurgeon because of this attraction that they saw in him and another person may have noticed something else that was more significant to him. It's kind of a combination of gifts that a man has to have to be this kind of a preacher and to have this kind of a response from the from the public. He had to be a godly man. He had to be an intelligent man. He had to be a marvelous speaker. He had to be intellectually gifted. He had to have a, a great crowd of helpers around him that were his assistants. And he had to have uh, all of these periphery things that, it, that goes into making this kind of a preacher. Uh, in this kind of a success uh, that not only in his own generation but in the generations to come that the legacy of this man can live on and on and on. So my personal uh, evaluation of it is that from what I have read from others and what I have heard from others and what I observe from reading Spurgeon myself, it's just a combination of all the ingredients that it takes to make a Spurgeon. And if you focus in on his dedication to God, his faith in Christ, his eloquence as a preacher, his uh, ability to expound the scriptures, or his intelligence to be able to comprehend and to express what he comprehended. You could, you could take any one of those things, but without this element and without that element, you wouldn't have a Spurgeon. It's just all of these things working together to make the man that we call Spurgeon. And to take away any one of them, I would think you would uh, detract from him to that extent. So I just like to think of it uh, like we would look at a uh, handsome man or a beautiful woman. Uh, certainly she has many features that go into making her beauty. And a part of it is the physical outward things that we see. A part of it is our personality. A part of it is that person's intelligence. And, and just on and on and on you could go. Every individual thing goes into making that particular person to be what they are. And, and of course, to God be the glory for all of it with regard to Spurgeon. If he had a great mind, the Lord gave it to him. If he had great speaking ability, God enabled him. If he had great ability to comprehend and express the teachings of the Scripture, God had worked it out and, and, and brought it out of him. And if he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God to have a spiritual unction, then God gets the credit for all of it. But I just don't think there's any one element that you focus in on and say, this was Spurgeon's secret. He was a praying man. Uh, this was Spurgeon's secret. He was a godly man. This was Spurgeon's secret. He uh, was uh, an intelligent man, a genius or whatever. I just don't think it's any one thing. It's the combination of all those right. gifts. Right. Well, with that, uh, Bob, I guess it's time now for us to start an analysis of the Spurgeon Library. Uh, there's viewers out there that would like to know more about this man and his works. And uh, I guess uh, of the books we have on display here by Spurgeon, uh, you are, as far as I can see, an authority on the works of Spurgeon. You were instrumental in having a lot of these books and works reprinted. Mm -hmm. So uh, with your expertise in this field, I would like you to begin uh, just taking different works by Spurgeon and giving us a little synopsis of the, of the particular work. Tell us a little bit about it, maybe some history of it, and what benefit it would be to the reader. Well, Larry, the sermon series we've already talked about. Now, if you had all of these volumes on display today, we would need a broader set than we have here. Did you say there was 63 volumes? Right, and, and if you would put them side by side on a shelf, they would occupy, if I remember correctly, more than eight or nine feet of shelf space. Now, we do exhibit these books in that form at the Christian Booksellers Convention every year when we go there to exhibit, and it takes a shelf uh, approximately that long to hold these books. And so you're only looking at a portion of those. Now that is the main body of what we call the works of Spurgeon. His sermons from volume 1 to 63 covering the years 1855 to 1917. And uh, these are indexed in an index we have over here on the shelf, the complete index of Spurgeon's sermons by title. And they're also indexed 
by a text. You can go from Genesis to Revelation and have the text that Spurgeon preached on, and you can go to A to Z for the subjects that he preached on. Unfortunately, we did not have an individual topic index so that you could just go to every individual page for, uh, you know, just a coverage of various topics. That would be a, a grand thing for someone to do <laughs> and to be able to offer it to people. I could give you all the topics that Spurgeon covered in his sermons. But nevertheless, we do have the textual index and we have the subject, the sermon subject, the title of the sermon indexed alphabetically. And th that's the uh, foundation, you might say, of what we call the sermons and works of C.H. Spurgeon. It's the sermon set. Now down at the end of this uh, shelf here, we have another important work of Spurgeon. Actually, that was in four volumes originally. And this is called Lectures to My Students. Four individual books that Spurgeon uh, created for the benefit of his students who were in his pastor's college training for the ministry. Mm -hmm. Spurgeon had lectures that he delivered to these students, and he also had a book that he wrote advising them with regard to commentaries on the Bible and individual books of the Bible, his opinion of those books are available at that time for purchase or some that have been published down through the years. And then he had another book he created called The Art of Illustration, advising his students on how to use illustrations in preaching. Well, those four books had never been put together in one volume. And so when we published it, we put them all in one book. And so it's called Lectures to My Students. And all four of those books, just as they were originally published, we photographed it exactly as it was originally published by Pastor Warren Alabaster, who published Spurgeon's books. So that is another set of books within itself, although it's in one volume. So uh, let's say uh, someone's watching right now, and maybe they're thinking about uh, a book such as this. Maybe they're thinking about uh, getting into preaching, or, or maybe they're a pastor themselves, or, or s s some kind of... Uh, pastoral ministry of, of some sort, would this be a good book to use in, let's say, your own personal Christian ministry to others? Oh, yes. It comes highly recommended by preachers all down through the years of time that have read it. It's been kept in print by various publishers. These individual books have. But uh, we thought, well, why just have four individual books? Why not just put it all together? And so we put it all together in one volume, and that's the way you'll see it out on the market today. Lectures to my students, all at four books, all in one volume. And then immediately above that, we have on display the autobiography of Spurgeon, which actually he did not write in the sense that he just sat down to write an autobiography. But, but his wife and secretary, Mr. J.W. Harrell, put together his letters his uh, individual articles that he had written that did tell about his life, some things out of his sermons, as you can see the subtitle, his diary, letters, and records. And this was done after Spurgeon died and came out uh, not too many years after he died. And it is the source, the most authoritative source of information with regard to C.H. Spurgeon. There have been many, many biographies written by Spurgeon. You'll find that every one of them will inevitably draw off of Spurgeon's autobiography by Mrs. Spurgeon and Mr. Harrell. And that originally was four large books. And we took it and republished it two volumes to the book. So we have all four volumes. But what I want to emphasize is, again, it's unedited, it's unabridged, and we've taken out nothing. We left in all the hundreds of photographs that were in the original books. Now, there, have been, there has been at least one effort to reprint this, but unfortunately, the company that did so did some abridging work. They cut out some of the material and, and many, many of the pictures. But uh, we have kept in everything, every little thing that was in the original books. It's in these books here. So... Uh, again, we can somewhat boast that we're the only ones to reprint the original autobiography since that early edition that was brought out by Passmore and Alabaster, and I think on this side, the Atlantic Funkin' Wagnalls and uh, 
maybe a company in Philadelphia had done it years ago during that same period of time. But in recent years, we're the ones to bring back the original autobiography. Now, that's another set. That's four volumes on the life of Spurgeon. Well, it seems like this autobiography, as you mentioned a while ago, uh, would beat out any, any just standard biography that anyone else would put together. I mean, yes, I'm often asked about the biographies of Spurgeon, and I have been myself a collector of biographies of Spurgeon over the years. I've been accumulating Spurgeon materials uh, through the years since about 1953 or 54. And uh, 53 is when I first saw the name of Spurgeon to uh, begin to have some appreciation for him. And ever since then, I've tried to accumulate everything I could. And I've collected quite a number of biographies. I don't have all the biographies that have been written about Spurgeon. But the ones I like best are the ones that were written by men that were alive during Spurgeon's time. And they knew Spurgeon. And, and they worked closely with Spurgeon. And I'd like to mention uh, in that to category, G.H. Uh, Pike, who is one of Spurgeon's assistants and, and a minister and a worker with Spurgeon, and Robert Schindler, and uh, another uh, gentleman, W.Y. Fullerton. Uh, these men wrote biographies of Spurgeon, and uh, they became uh, very popular uh, in their own rights. But uh, they too... Uh, had to draw off of the records that were available in the autobiography, although they could also draw off some of their personal experience and knowledge of Spurgeon. Now, I don't want to say that no one in the subsequent period of time could write a good biography of Spurgeon, but I'm just saying that somehow every once in a while there is a tradition or a legend or some story that gets involved in to the materials and it becomes a part of the Spurgeon legend and maybe it's not really an accurate story. Maybe it's not really right up to detail but they got it out of some book or they presented it as being the truth uh, but it may not have been the absolute fact because the person presented it didn't know Spurgeon and it was a second hand report. So that has happened. So I like those books that were written about Spurgeon by men who knew him, who lived during his time, uh, in preference to those that are written that were written afterwards. Now, and, didn't you? Didn't you? If I could interject right here, didn't you put together a book called the uh, something right here? The pictorial. There it is. Right. This is a little book that I first put together as a magazine uh, about this size, and. Uh, it was so uh, popular and uh, so successful in the sense of uh, people wanting to know more about Spurgeon that we put it into a book. And this is the edition that we have in print right now. And uh, we have printed it, uh, well, uh, this is the second edition of it. We printed the first edition in 1974, printed several thousand of them. And then we printed this edition of it. And uh, it's, uh, well, Mainly, it has photographs, and um, I don't know if I can just, you can just more or less see the fact that it is largely uh, focused on uh, presenting pictures, although there is a lot of written material in it telling the story of Spurgeon very briefly. But basically, it's a pictorial book with some commentary, and I call it the pictorial biography of C.H. Spurgeon. And uh, it's been quite successful in uh, letting people know very quickly. I mean, you can read that in a very short sitting. And, you know, people like, a, like pictures, as they say, <laughs> worth a thousand words. There you go. There you and go. Uh, so that is uh, something I put together. All right. Well, uh, as we continue our survey here, uh, I guess the uh, next question I'd like to ask you about on, on Spurgeon's works here is you have something near you. It looks like another volume of books called The Sword and the and Trowel. What's that? All right. I will get to that, but I don't want to overlook this set down here on the end of which I have one representative volume. Is it The this Treasury of David? A, this is The Treasury of David, and it's called The Treasury of David because it has to do with the Psalms. Mm -hmm. It's the only commentary Spurgeon ever put together on the Old Testament. 
Uh, no, he didn't have a commentary as such on any other book. But he had 20 years and seven volumes <laughs> on the Psalms. I guess that explains why he didn't have one on some of the other books. Mm -hmm. It's because he spent so much time on this one. But for 20 years, he accumulated and uh, published a volume after volume after volume of the uh, Psalms. And he called it the Treasury of David. Now, someone has called this Spurgeon's magnum opus because it seems like he put more effort into this than anything else other than his sermons. Well, uh, we uh, were dissatisfied with the additions of this set that was on the that were on the market. Uh, there were some three volume editions and this, that, and the other for a period of time, and so we said, let's go back and put it in the format that it was from the original, seven hardbound volumes, seven cloth-bound volumes, not just hardback with an artificial type covering on it of some kind with a bunch of decoration. Let's put a good cloth binding on it. Let's gold stamp it and put the original uh, symbol of the harp on it. And so that's what we did a few years ago, the Treasury of David. So now we have the seven-volume Treasury of David, just exactly as C. H. Spurgeon himself published it when he was alive. So these three-volume editions and these paperback editions or these abridged editions or whatever they may be, if a person says, hey, I want something better than that, we have it. We have the seven-volume hardbound, cloth-bound edition of the Treasury of David. Now, over here, you ask about this set of books. This is called The Sword and the Trial. And that was the title of Spurgeon's magazine, The Sword and the Trial. And uh, he started this in the year 1865. And uh, it went on through his lifetime and continued even after his lifetime. And the church in London, I have a copy of it here somewhere, is still publishing uh, that magazine today called The Sword and Trial. Of course, it's in a different format than it was back then. But what we did, we went into these original volumes, and we could not reprint the whole set of these because uh, each year a collection of these monthly magazines was about the size of a Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit volume, big, thick collection of these monthly magazines. So instead of reprinting everything, which would have incorporated a lot of writers and a lot of miscellaneous material from others, we took out the writings of Spurgeon. We took out his editorials. We took out some of the notes, he called them, uh, and, and any sermons he published in there. And he had a series of little short tracts that he published in there. He would tell about his travels. Some of his letters would be published in there when he would go to France, for example, and write back. They would publish his letters that he wrote in the Sword and Trial magazine. And so, in effect, you're getting a uh, history of Spurgeon from year to year, from month to month, through the Sword and Trial magazine. In fact, we're working on a book right now written by Eric Hayden, that's drawn exclusively from the Sword and Trial magazine, and it's on the life of Spurgeon entitled The Unforgettable Spurgeon. And he's drawing all of his materials for this out of the Sword and Trial magazine. Well, what we did, we started this series of publishing Spurgeon's writings as they appeared in the Sword and Trial magazine. For instance, here is a, a volume that from 1869, 1868, 1869, 1870, and then going right on up, each volume has three years in it, and we're still working on it. We're not finished with this, but that's The Sword and Trial. Now, this is another book that came out of The Sword and Trial called Sermons on Unusual Occasions. Uh, these were occasions other than the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the pulpit, uh, he preached these at various other places around about on various other circumstances and uh, situations. And so they're like kind of... Like at weddings, funerals. Yeah, a wedding, a funeral out on an open air place or uh, at his college, for example, an annual conference lecture. Uh, miscellaneous places and events other than his usual weekly sermon 
at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So that's a collection of sermons that were taken out of the sword and trial. And so far as I know, we're the only publisher who has ever issued these particular sermons because we had to pick them out of from the Sword and Trial magazine. And the gentleman who did it for us, Eric Hayden, who was the former pastor of Spurgeon's Tabernacle uh, when they rebuilt it for the third time. Mr. Hayden helped us do that. Seems like that book, uh, unusual uh, you know, sermons for unusual occasions could be useful to some preachers and uh, other Bible students and so forth uh, if they need material for a sermon at a at a funeral or well, a wedding people, or so people forth. People who love Spurgeon and love to read Spurgeon and are somewhat collectors of mm. Spurgeon material, they want anything and everything and we're happy to be able to provide those sermons to them uh, that they probably could not get otherwise unless they could get the original Sword and Trial magazine. Right. So it's just another volume of sermons that, uh, uh, that Spurgeon lovers will appreciate. Well, what's the next one we have? Here? Well, here's a book called Able to the Uttermost. And uh, these were sermons that were left over after they quit printing Spurgeon sermons in 1917. Uh, I say left over, there's an explanation in Spurgeon's last volume, 1917, explaining why they were stopping the sermon series. World War I is going on, and the shortage of paper was uh, a situation they were having to deal with. So they stopped printing Spurgeon sermons, but they announced that uh, this doesn't mean that we don't have some left. And so later on, they did bring out another collection of these sermons that had not been published. These do not appear in this sermon set. It's able to the uttermost. And uh, let's see, I forgot exactly how many sermons are in here, but I can turn quickly and find 20 sermons that are not in this set here of C.A. Spurgeon's sermons, and Able to the Uttermost is one of the titles of uh, one of the sermons in here. In fact, it's the first sermon in the book, and then all the other uh, chapters are individual sermons. These also are reprinted, unabridged, untouched, just like the original volume was printed, uh, I think it was something like 1922 or 23 of that period of time. Now, another collection of Spurgeon's sermons this book called Sermons on Sovereignty. Now these sermons are in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in the New Park Street pulpit. But Larry, would you believe it? This was my first book to publish by Spurgeon. I, Bob Ross, took these sermons out, selected them to publish. And it was on the sovereignty of God. And we put them together and published them Spurgeon's Sermons on Sovereignty. And this is the first book that I ever published for Spurgeon. And the original book, this is a second printing, the original book was a hardback book and uh, it had a blue cover and it had a, a gold and purple uh, cover on it, a jacket with a crown in front. Because at that time in my own life, I was feeling a great need for people to be aware of this message of sovereignty that had been somewhat lost in my generation. And I felt like one of the best ways to bring it back in a balanced, true, evangel evangelical way would be to make Sir Spurgeon's sermons on these themes available. And so all the sermons in this book have to do with the sovereignty of God some of the doctrines that are called the doctrines of grace. And no one could preach them any better and any more balanced and any more evangelistically than C.A. Spurgeon. And that book has had a tremendous influence in drawing men back to the truths of the sovereignty of God. So that's another collection. I remember uh, years ago I was at a Bible conference and that was one of the first Spurgeon books I purchased. It was on a table, and I, I wanted to know more about the sovereignty of God. Is God really in control? And, right. and there it was, and I knew about Spurgeon, and I well, bought it uh, right off the table. We had let this book lie dormant for many years because, after all, all the sermons were in this set. 
but a missionary brother in Japan. He kept hounding us, wanting us to print this. And finally, he himself put up the money to finance it, and then later we paid the money back to him. And, his, and by the way, he died before we could pay him all the money back, but we did pay his widow, and uh, his name was Timothy Peach. And he was a missionary in Japan for many, many years. And as a matter of fact, we published his picture in this book to uh, honor him and to express our gratitude to him for the fact that uh, he did put up the uh, finances. And there is a photograph of uh, Brother Pish and his wife telling the story of how he volunteered to finance the publication of this book. And this man, like I say, was for years a missionary in Japan, and he was such a good hand at it, Larry, that he preached to the Japanese in their own language, and uh, uh, they said that uh, he was perfect with his pronunciation and everything. He was so much into his burden for the Japanese that uh, he just blended right in with them in the way that he could express the language. So uh, Spurgeon's works uh, assisted him in his uh, missionary efforts. Yes, and he was a great admirer of Spurgeon. Now, Larry, some of these other books, these are smaller books, but Pictures from Pilgrim's Progress is a book that Spurgeon wrote describing some of the characters in John Bunyan's book called The Pilgrim's Progress. Spurgeon testified that he read that book over a hundred times. Pilgrim's Progress? Yes, yeah, Spurgeon, he loved John Bunyan, and he loved that Pilgrim's Progress book. Is that a picture of the Pilgrim? Uh, that's a drawing that uh, was uh, uh, taken out of one of the old books about Pilgrim's Progress, and as the caption says, Evangelist points out the wicked gate. And those that are familiar with Bunyan's book will recognize mm -hmm. those terms, and I don't have mm -hmm. time to go into Bunyan's book mm -hmm. now. That would be another program. But at any rate, Spurgeon loved it, and he wrote a book describing uh, some of these characters and making a commentary about some of these characters in Bunyan's book. Now here's another little book, uh, a paperback book, called Speeches at Home and Abroad. Now this is another one similar to The Unusual Occasions, book in that these are sermons delivered other than his usual ministry at the Metropolitan Tabernacle and of course the index shows us where they were preached and what the subjects were and uh, there's uh, 18 sermons in this book so people that collect Spurgeon sermons would uh, want that book also. Now another little collection that we put together on the Beatitudes Spurgeon preached on what's called the Beatitudes. Several sermons are in the set, but we thought it would make a good thing to have them all in one volume. So this little book here, and this is a picture that was taken to me by a friend of mine. Uh, it's the Mount of Beatitudes in Israel, and uh, Brother Jack Windish took that when he was over in Israel doing the work that he was doing at the time. So uh, that's another collection of sermons and then here's one called Faith, What Is It? This is published, incidentally, by our friends at Christian Focus Publications. And here's one called John Plowman's Talk. Now, Spurgeon invented this mythical character called John Plowman. He was a, a farmer. And Spurgeon used this to uh, give out a homespun-type interpretation and application of Scripture. He had another volume in this same series, and we have it here. It's called uh, John Plowman's uh, Pictures. Here it is in a uh, smaller format. But uh, this vehicle he used to, uh, you know, kind of give simplicity to some of the basic principles of the Gospel and of the Bible without being so theological or churchy. It was, it was a, a way to simplify it in, in layman's terms, right. using this mythical character right. as, uh, and, and to in, draw the analogy. a homey, folksy type presentation, and usually on moral and ethical uh, type principles of behavior and life. Now, as we go on down the row here, uh, 
Here is his book, Around the Wicked Gate, which has to do with the way of salvation. And now when the, you, you say you're, you're not saying wicked, wicked, you're saying wicked. the wicked gate. That's and e this is drawn off of John Bunyan's writing again, that term, the wicked gate. Just for the viewers that uh, aren't familiar, what is that wicked gate? What is, what is the wicked gate? Well, Larry, it's a, a gate that uh, you'll find a description of in John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, I don't have time to tell the whole story about right, it, right. so I'm going it's to... Not, it's not a wicked, evil thing. It's just right, it one a, of the illustrations. It was an old-fashioned uh, gate that we don't hear about or see much anymore, and that was just a term for it that they used. And uh, then... Uh, you go on down the list here, we have the words of Jesus Christ from the cross. Another little collection that's also in this. Now, uh, a lot of these books we have taken out and put together under these kind of themes because this stands to be a uh, book on its own because it's all on the sayings of Jesus on the cross. What Jesus was saying on the cross, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was being crucified. And so this is why we put those in one volume, is to get this theme uh, covered by Spurgeon. Let him speak to this and, and not have someone have to buy so many volumes uh, to get it because these are not just arranged consecutively in those books uh, like we have them here. So that's why we do some of these special books. Here we have some historical information about Spurgeon that was written after his death in 1905, I believe, by a man named uh, Charles Ray. It's descriptive of the ministry of Spurgeon, and he tells about some of the records of how many books have been published and some of the testimonies and all that. It's called A Marvelous Ministry. This man also wrote a biography of Mrs. Spurgeon. Now, here's some more books that have to do with history on Spurgeon. And I, you see all these are the same size. We're getting kind of away from some of Spurgeon's own materials. But uh, these will give a person who's interested in information, a lot of information on Spurgeon. Here is Spurgeon's own book called The Metropolitan Tabernacle, Its History and Work. And we published that not too awful long ago. And uh, this is in Spurgeon's own language, his own writing about the history of his church that he pastored. And then here we have Eric Hayden's history of the tabernacle, which uh, comprehends, of course, the information Spurgeon has presented, but also brings us up into the 20th century and brings us right up to date at the time that this book was last published and I believe that was only like, uh, let's see, 1992, not too long ago. So we're brought right up to date on information about the church in London. Here's one that we asked Mr. Hayden to do for us. It's called the Spurgeon Family. People often ask me, uh, what about Spurgeon's relatives? What about uh, this, that, and the other about his background? Well, this book does as good a job as you can find about the family of C. H. Spurgeon, and um, we put that into print just, oh, I don't know, too long ago in the 1990s. Another little book by Eric Hayden called Highlights in the Life of C. H. Spurgeon. Now, these articles were written by Eric Hayden for the jackets of the Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit. The back side of those jackets, year by year, we carried an article by Eric Hayden reviewing the life of Spurgeon for that year. And so when we got through with them, we decided these are worthy of going into one book. And so here you have it, year by year, a review of the life of C. H. Spurgeon. Now all those are kind of in what we call biographical and historical category, but uh, like I say, people who like Spurgeon like to read everything they can about him, learn all they can about him. Now here's a book called The Covenant of Grace. It's also a collection of sermons that's in the sermon set. Well, why do we keep reprinting things like this? Well, first of all, Larry, 
Uh, that's a big set of books. And to ask someone to buy all those books to get some of these subjects covered, uh, some people just can't put out that kind of money. And furthermore, uh, even one big volume, although there's uh, 50 to 60 sermons in those individual volumes, it's not going to cover all of these subjects that a person may be interested in. So we have uh, a collection of sermons in little books like this. Now let me ask you, uh, in each one of the, the, the volumes, how many, you might have mentioned this before, but how many pages are in each one of these individual volumes? Well, uh, Larry, some of them are over 600 pages and some of them are over 700 pages. I remember, if I'm not mistaken, the largest number in any one book, I believe, is 738. Uh, I'm sure there's some 720, and I think some of them are 738 or 740. And then uh, there are others that like have uh, 600 plus. Okay, let's, let's take a conservative figure then. If you have 63 volumes and multiply that by 600 pages, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pages to have well, to read. And uh, when these, these books really simplify it when you're looking for, right. looking for a, a, a topic. And, and Larry, we have worked out that total somewhere in one of our ads. Oh, here we are. 41,500 pages. 41,500, okay, that's 3,561 <laughs> sermons. And as a guesstimate, based on counting the words of a few pages, 25 million words or more. Amazing. So uh, quite a collection. Well, Bob, we're just about out of time for this, this segment. We'll continue in the next segment. But I'd like you to, since you started on this book, just briefly uh, explain for the viewing audience uh, what is the covenant of grace. Well, these are sermons, and uh, the themes of these sermons are the covenant, the wondrous covenant, God in the covenant, Christ in the covenant, the Holy Spirit in the covenant, the blood in the covenant, 12 covenant mercies, the covenant pleaded, and the covenant tar. So it's all about the covenant of grace that God in eternity planned and then in time brought to pass when he sent Jesus Christ into the world and uh, he furnished the blood of the everlasting covenant of which we read in the Bible. He gave his blood of the covenant. God who foreordained that Jesus Christ would come and die for our sins and that we would be saved through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Well, uh, Spurgeon covers it. The Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and all the mercies and benefits of the covenant. And they are, let's see, two, four, six, eight, nine sermons here on this theme of the covenant of grace. And they're, like I say, they're spread out through this set, so we put them all into one volume makes it convenient to read on that particular subject, just like on the words of the cross. You have it in one volume. You don't have to plow through all these others to find. 1,000 pages. Right. Of <laughs> but we always, we always tell people that uh, this one is either in or not in the Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit right. because we don't want them to think that they're getting totally new materials right. on that. Right. So we try to let them know when we do, do this kind of a repetitious format. All right. Well, Bob, I appreciate the, this run through. We still have uh, quite a few books to go through in, Spurgeon's, in the Spurgeon Library. So we'll continue on that theme in our next program in the series. So I hope the viewers will stay with us as we continue to survey the works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon.
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available.